Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Doug Hanto, and I am chair of the Surgical Ethics Working Group at the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. And on behalf of the Surgical Ethics Working Group at the Center, I would like to welcome everyone to our first Harvard Surgical Ethics Conference, Ethical Challenges in Global Surgery. Over 900 individuals registered for the conference from around the world, and we would like to thank you for getting up early, staying up late, and taking time off from work or leisure to join us this evening. I believe we have an exciting hour and a half ahead of us. Uh, first, let me go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we will um, have a Q&A feature to which you can submit questions at any time uh, during the uh, lectures. Uh, these are found in the meeting controls at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, we will not be answering questions uh, during the talks, but we will be uh, gathering the questions and uh, then uh, Dr. Mira will be uh, asking the panelists uh, questions during the discussion period based on your questions in the Q&A. Um, you can also continue this conversation on Twitter using hashtag HMSBioethics. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature to send a message to all the panelists and a staff member will help. If you are interested in upcoming events, news or education programs, please subscribe to the Center for Bioethics emails at bioethics.hms.harvard.edu slash subscribe. Uh, in addition, uh, these sessions are being recorded and they will be available on the HMS uh, Center for Bioethics YouTube uh, site um, after uh, the conferences are over. So without any further ado, let me introduce um, our first moderator. Dr. John Mara is the plastic surgeon in chief at Boston Children's Hospital and an expert in cases of cleft lip and palate, craniosynostosis, encephalocele and complex SEA uh, facial cleft. Dr. Mira is Professor of Global Surgery in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Boston Children's Hospital Professor of Surgery in the field of Pediatric Plastic Surgery, and Director of the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. He is a leader in global surgery and was one of three co-chairs of the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery that held its first meeting in 2014 and that led to the publication of the Commission's report Global Surgery 2030, Evidence and Solutions for Achieving Health, Welfare, and Economic, economic Development. Thank you, Dr. Mira, for joining us and moderating this session. Dr. Mira will introduce uh, the speakers uh, for tonight's session. John? Thank you, Dr. Hanto. Thank you very much. We have a wonderful 90 minutes coming up, and I'm looking forward to all three of our speakers. And I will first introduce Dr. Bethany het -Gauthier. Dr. Het Gauthier is a biostatistician specializing in health systems and implementation science research in Sub-Saharan Africa. She is an associate professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School and of biostatistics at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And she is the director of research in the program of global surgery and social change. Dr. Het Gauthier. Great, thank you so much. And let me just get queued up here. Um, can you see slides? Great. Um, so I really appreciate Dr. Hanto and to your team the invitation. Um, this is a unique lens to look at global surgery. And so I'm excited to explore this with you and with my co-panelists. And Dr. Mira, always a pleasure to be in events with you. And thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to set the stage for the conversation tonight, really thinking about why we're in this space um, and, and should we be here and how do we operate in, in this context. So just as a bit of a background, um, the Lancet Commission in, in Global Surgery that Dr. Hunter referred to um, and Dr. Mira was a co-chair of um, was really some seminal work in outlining the needs, the global needs for surgery. Um, and it was um, really something that actually brought me to the field. I'm not a surgeon, I'm a health systems researcher, but this commission laid a um, compelling case for why 
um, we need to be paying more attention to the global surgical need um, more broadly. So just a few highlights of the commission, um, probably the biggest highlight, 5 billion people around the world lack access. And of course, that's not evenly distributed. Um, there are historically marginalized populations that are the most um, in need of, of global surgery. Um, there needs to be 143 million additional procedures to fill the unmet need for surgery. 81 million people are at financial risk. Um, they would experience catastrophic health expenditures for surgical care every year. So it's not just about providing surgery, it's about providing affordable and accessible surgery to these populations. We need to invest another uh, 350 billion into surgical and um, anesthesia systems to be able to address these deficits. And then finally, the, just really making the case that surgery, obstetrics, and anesthesia are just integral parts of the healthcare system. And so we really can't talk about primary health care, comprehensive health care, universal health care without really addressing these deficits that were outlined in the commission. So with that in mind, um, of course, these are not, un, are not evenly distributed, these needs. And so this is showing you a graph of the global distributions of surgeons, anesthesiologists, and obstetricians per 100,000. And the target for this is to have at least 20 per 100,000 to really address the deficits that, that I just outlined. And what you can see here is there are many countries in the world that are exceeding this target of 20 per 100,000. So the top um, density in this, this map is 85 per 100,000 in Sweden. And then there are many countries that are far, far below um, this target of 20. So um, Rwanda, where much of my work is concentrated, has um, 0.68 per 100,000, and Sierra Leone has 0.15. And so it's not just about addressing surgical needs everywhere, but it's really about prioritizing populations that have been historically marginalized and finding ways to both, both address the short-term needs, but also the long-term um, needs of these systems to be able to provide the surgical services. So clearly there is a need for more global surgery. And so then the question is, do we have a moral obligation to address this need? So are we morally obliged to respond? And I oftentimes think about my moral obligation from just a human rights perspective. So health is a human right. Um, and I provide here a quote from um, Paul Farmer, who was my department chair um, and really instrumental in, um, in the founding of the program in global surgery and social change that John directs and, and um, Dr. Junjawala and Dr. Joseph and I are members of. And for this, um, just this quote from Paul really brings us home. For me, an area of moral clarity, you're in front of someone who's suffering and you have the tools at your disposal to alleviate that suffering, suffering or eradicate it and you act. So we really are, from a human rights perspective, have a moral obligation to use our skill sets to address the global surgery deficit um, that's highlighted in the commission. A second platform for moral obligation is thinking about it from um, our complicity and benefits from systems in which we are complicit. So um, you know, the foundation of we are complicit in and benefactors of systems that contribute to the global surgery inequities, and therefore we are morally obliged to try and reduce those deficits. So I wanted to give you a few examples of that. Um, this is a paper that was highlighting um, the, the colonial era and how um, we globally have benefited from the colonization of Africa and also how we, in that colonization, really undermined um, health systems that were already in place and, and the way that people traditionally accessed care and didn't invest in the infrastructure as we were extracting um, resources from that infrastructure. So that is a, a historical um, complicity from which we benefited from. But there's even modern day examples of this. And so here's an example um, about how we in the US benefit from what, how this headline um, poses it, stealing doctors from other countries. And so when we think about this SAO density and the fact that Rwanda and Sierra Leone is so, are so far from achieving um, their density targets, we have to recognize that we benefit in our healthcare system from extracting the, the human resources from many of these countries. So if we feel compelled that we have a moral obligation to address the surgical need, my um, immediately, I immediately start thinking, 
is moral obligation enough to bring me to this space and to keep me in this space? And some of the extreme situations we find ourselves in when we are only compelled by moral obligation. So here's an example of a young American, and it's a very extreme example, but a young American who, um, her, in her own words, it was very, very profound feeling and experience. It's kind of hard to even describe in words. It was like something that I was supposed to do. So this is a young American who in Uganda started a medical mission to um, treat young U Ugandan children and actually under a series of investigations found that her lack of medical knowledge and medical care actually was to the detriment of these children, led to many deaths, and she's currently under many lawsuits um, because of that. But she felt compelled to do the work. And I would argue in that moral drive probably had blind spots to her own weaknesses of um, how she might actually be causing more harm than actually trying to benefit the system she was trying to benefit. So this is a really extreme example. I'm going to just briefly put up one that's, that's um, really more something that we would see um, often, and, and Dr. Junior Wall is going to talk to you more about, you know, the discussions around the ethics of surgical missions. And I purposely put up Mercy Ships here as the screenshot example of short-term sur surgical missions trying to address some of these deficits, because I know one person personally who works for Mercy Ships who I know is constantly interrogating how he is in the space and the contributions of the Mercy Ships. So um, it's not that I think this, this group is bad. I actually think it's a group that's under evolution and it's a really exciting evolution to do, but it is a place of discussion and, and Dr. Jun Jawal will take us through that discussion. But you know, are you in mercy ships because of the moral obligation? What are your motivations for being there? Um, clearly it has very um, personal benefits to individuals. So here's an article talking about one of the patients who um, recovered and received um, excellent outcomes because of the care through mercy ships. But I'll just put these here, just the revisiting of these surgical trips. And again, um, the next speaker will speak more about um, you know, these surgical missions and their contributions and the ethics of them. So I wanted to highlight that um, Dr. Hanto came to me with a proposal of you know, lay out the, the need for global surgery and our moral obligations. And again, I immediately think, well, is moral obligation enough to bring us to the space? And I wanted to highlight some of the strategies that I employ or that I, our teams try to employ to really think about um, how do we operate in the space in a way that's um, contributing and truly aligned to our moral obligation, but also not um, vulnerable to our blind spots. And how do we successfully operate in that, this space that pun is intended for, for the surgical crowd, but I want to give you a few solutions or a few options of how we think about our work. So the first is, even though it's oftentimes uncomfortable to really interrogate the space, um, and this is just a slide from um, two of our surgical fellows, Dr. Aliande and Dr. Miranda, who talk about um, both the history of colonialism in, in health systems and in um, just more broadly, and then thinking about how neocolonialism presents itself in global surgery. And they are challenging conversations to have, but having these conversations helps us better see our blind spots and know um, how we might try to counter those. Um, this is another article I want to point you to that talks a lot about the power relations between the different key players in global surgery and global health and thinking about how those power relations manifest in the space. And again, understanding those power relations really help us identify our blind spots and encounter them. Another second thing we try to do is not just interrogate the space, but interrogate ourselves in the space. So why am I here? Um, and I <clears throat> want to point you to um, this presentation by Dr. Irhan Bua, where he talks a lot about our identities. And um, if we're just going to a community because we want to help solely from moral obligation, that's not enough to really do good work, that we have to have other um, motivations. You know, how does this benefit me? How does this help um, my goals, what's the alignment between my professional goals and the communities that I serve, how do I make sure there's better alignment, good communication, these are all things that we need to think about, not just our moral obligation. 
Um, another part of interrogating ourselves in this space is thinking about why we do the things that we do. And so these are two um, papers that I worked on as um, in the last few years. One that highlights how our academic affiliation, so specifically me as Harvard faculty, and the promotion systems within academic affiliations really motivate what I claim to be bad practice. So, um, you know, in a few years, I'll go up for promotion, I'll count the number of first author publications that I have, and that promotional system manifests in the fact that folks who are affiliated with U.S. Um, high-profile institutions, um, their papers are less likely to include colleagues from the countries that research is about, they're less likely to include those colleagues in prominent authorship positions. And so there's evidence of um, bad pra collaborative practice that comes um, from those institutions. And so one of the solutions we put forth is, if we know that that drives um, less ethical collaboration or less equitable collaboration, then we really need to be addressing those promotion policies and trying to change those pressures so that we can be more equitable and ethical in that approach. The third thing I want to put forward is just adopting very pragmatic strategies to improve the practice of how we um, occupy the global surgery space. So this is just an example, and it was one of the recommended readings um, for tonight of some of the very practical things that our team does to try and make sure that, yes, we know we have blind spots, yes, we know we're under pressures, but how do we try to specifically counteract that. So um, we do a lot of trainings that are focused on global surgery and global surgery research. Um, we do host um, PGSCC fellows at our project sites, but we make sure that there's a joint learning plan that benefits both our colleagues in Rwanda for me and our PGSCC fellows. And then we're really thoughtful about mapping out our research space and making sure that um, there's opportunity for everyone on our team to grow professionally in the work. And that again, we don't have blind spots of people that we might exclude or not think about for opportunities just because of the historical power dynamics. And then finally, and I think you'll hear this a lot um, throughout the evening, is just really centering our work um, for and through our partners. And so um, you know, I love the work that I do in the global surgery space, but it is at service to um, other colleagues and it's at the direct request of other colleagues and trying to make sure that I'm addressing their requests and not just motivated um, by what I think is right, by um, what I feel compelled to do by my moral obligation. So just in quick summary, um, you know, just a very brief tour about the needs in global surgery. I do think we have a moral obligation to be um, addressing these needs in global surgery. I don't think that moral obligation is enough to bring us to this space. And then hopefully some very practical strategies that we can adopt to make sure that we're um, countering um, some of our blind spots if we just were to, to be in the space because of moral obligation. So I look forward to the discussion and I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Mira for the next speaker. Dr. Hetgothier, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I, I certainly have a number of questions and I, I know our uh, participants will as well. Um, just to remind the participants, please you know, keep your questions, keep them coming. I'm, I'm watching the Q&A board here and after our third speaker, we'll have a chance to, uh, to answer all those together. So uh, I'd like to introduce our second speaker now, Dr. Michelle Joseph. Dr. Joseph is an academic trauma and orthopedic surgeon. She's an instructor in global health and social medicine at the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School, and an adjunct associate professor at the University Uniformed Services, Walter Reed. At the PGSSC, she holds co-leadership as our Chief Strategy and Health Equity Officer, and she is one of the inaugural recipients of the American College of Surgeons Board of Regents Innovative Grant, Grant for DEI and Anti-Racism. Dr. Joseph, Thank you very much for the introduction. Good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you who are joining us this uh, today. It's a pleasure to be able to be part of this uh, panel. I'm excited to share with you some of this information and uh, especially looking forward to the Q&A that we will have at the end. So I'll get straight into this complex surgical procedures. As you've heard from Dr. Hed Gutier, we have this moral obligation and need to 
go even beyond that because the consequences are great when we don't offer and provide the surgical care that is required. When we look at the economics of this, the consequences are great. Publications in global health policy and those specifically related to surgery have modeled 12.3 trillion economic consequence for not providing surgery. The ethics around this have been discussed most recently in a BMJ a global health uh, publication focus mainly on the clinical care delivery, which will be the main focus of this talk, but also on the education component, the training components as well associated with the ethical delivery of global surgical care. Partnerships, as you heard from uh, Dr. Hedgesia, are terribly important, especially making sure that they are equitable. There is true collaboration. And we're really honing in on the key uh, matters when it comes to appropriate care delivery. So what do we mean by complex? Well, today I'll talk to you about a definition of what complex means in the context of this particular work. The overarching challenges that we face, the challenges in the context of the Beauchamp Childress uh, framework, but also how it can be adapted to uh, global surgery um, at large. And then finally, I'll touch on some of the solutions, which we've already uh, heard to some degree. So what is complex surgery? Well, all surgery has a propensity to be complex and setting really matters, but there are some absolute factors. The surgical procedure itself may require highly specialized surgeons with skills that are rare, surgical equipment or implants that are expensive and not readily available at all centers. Anesthetic requirements, not only lengthy surgery, but complex in delivery. And then we have the relative factors, comorbidities. And I call them relative because if you could imagine in a high income facility in a tertiary center, which is used to having uh, patients who have significant comorbidities, but they are equipped both in resource and skill set in terms of the workforce, they're able to deal with these relatively easily. If you're in a setting where these things are sparse, then suddenly these comorbidities can pose great problems to delivery of surgical care, creating a complex surgical uh, uh, procedure. In addition, adjunct uh, requirements for care delivery, not just the surgical procedure itself, but the post-operative care. And finally, the facility capabilities. So when we think about complex surgery, you don't necessarily need to imagine the complex reconstruction of a hand or a facial trauma or facial uh, deformity, but rather think about it in the context of these factors, absolute and relative. The overarching challenges that we face from the lens of the global surgery practitioner, and by that I'm talking about those of us who reside in high income countries that refer to it as global surgery. Our perception of the challenges, because we do not reside in these spaces day in, day out throughout our careers, is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the knowledge. The delivery of this complex care really requires a good understanding of the root causes and they can be country specific or region specific, the nuanced complexities that you cannot simply gather the intel on through short term mission trips, but you're really reliant on those who are living and working in this space on a day, day in, day out basis. The geopolitical components uh, to the delivery of systems strengthening when it comes to ensuring that surgical care is widely available and we are really reaching that unmet need and the stability in which this uh, care is uh, attempting to be delivered. If we were to summarize these uh, overarching challenges, there are three main areas I'd like to focus on. The feasibility of the delivery of this care. What is the power paradigm? And that really ties in with the development of the partnerships that we really feel are important for um, ethical delivery of global surgery and the sustainability of them. So feasibility, we're really thinking here about the resources that are available and the time that is spent. And Dr. Jajan Muller will go on to talk about the actual um, pros 
and cons of the uh, short term mission chips, but time matters. Time matters from a individual point of care delivery to a systems uh, level. Understanding the barriers and facilitators at both of these levels is key to really acknowledging the feasibility of delivering complex surgery based on the definition I mentioned. And defining who owns the responsibility of the patient's care. If you can imagine the delivery of care uh, for a patient, uh, if you're only there for a short space of time, who picks up the potential complications that may happen? And therefore your ethical question is, was it wise to do the surgery in the first place? And whose responsibility should it be to pick up those issues should they arise? What are the clinical subpoena? We'll go on to talk about that a bit more later. In terms of the power paradigm, this is really embedded in the history, the, the colonial history, but also the neo-colonial as well, and the disconnect between um, who makes the decisions at the table versus who is actually experiencing the attempts of delivering this um, these complex surgeries on, on a regular basis. We have to try and redefine this. And when you think about the shift that is required in this power, power, uh, this power paradigm, what we're really talking about is utilizing this word equity over equality. What we want to see is that those who are making the decisions in this space and really driving what the priorities are need to be those who, who reside in uh, country and are uh, involved in the delivery of surgical uh, care. And how do we sustain this? How do we just sustain this attempt at uh, delivering feasible uh, complex surgery? It does come down to funding and also uh, independence, so you're not reliant on these short term uh, missions and a shift towards systems building and education and long term partnerships whereby you are building up the expertise in country. Essentially, you, you want to aim to do yourself out of uh, a job when it comes to the delivery of this healthcare type. So when we think about this in terms of ethical frameworks, one that we're all familiar with is, are the four principles. And how does this fit into global surgery and what are the challenges? So I'll briefly have this up, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice. And really what we're talking about here is how much do the patients have um, say in making their decisions? Uh, we want them to have that level of uh, autonomy. And this is for all patients. Um, doing good and promoting that while avoiding a harm, maximizing the benefit of patients and society at large. Now, what does this look like in the context of global surgery? Well, there are some issues that we need to talk about. There are certain barriers that uh, suddenly come to the fore. Cultural uh, awareness, language barriers that one may face. Are you truly gaining uh, full consent when um, attempting to deliver uh, complex surgery in these uh, low to middle income uh, settings? What happens when there is a um, ambiguity? Do you proceed in life saving urgent events or do you stick to the moral obligation of ensuring that uh, the patient is making a fully informed uh, decision. These are challenges that uh, are not fully answered by the uh, framework in its entirety for principles. Looking at beneficence, when we think about global surgery practitioners, so surgeons from HICs going to LMICs, there is always a chance that you may end up working outside of your normal scope of practice. So the ethical question here is would you want to deliver standard of care that is potentially what you may consider lower than the normal standard of care that you would deliver in your home country? These are really hard questions to answer, particularly when it comes to acute uh, emergencies. One would argue that the scope, you should remain in, within your scope of practice um, and maintain a good, high quality standard of care. That would be the ethical code, challenging when you're in those environments. And who manages the cont continuity of care? How do you manage follow up? What are the long term potential problems? Well, there is always a problem potential for complications that may occur. 
the question you should ask yourself is, was it the right choice to make to deliver that surgery, knowing that there may be potential consequences that you will not be around to uh, take care of? In addition, if you're offering high level uh, surgery that requires um, adjunct support, HDUs or ITU uh, services, are you exhausting uh, resources from other um, areas that the, the facilities may offer in terms of healthcare? How do you balance that um, real moral ground between delivering to many versus uh, fewer patients without forming these unintended uh, consequences? And finally, the justice component. The ideal scenario is that we offer equitable uh, access to all in need of surgical care. The reality is patients are selected based on the safety, based on the workforce uh, that's available, based on the resources and the location, the facility um, uh, capabilities. So if we go beyond using these four principles and think about things more in a systemic um, fashion, I mentioned the workforce density issue. The infrastructure is key. Systems may be isolated and not necessarily, there may not be the necessary communication between the um, tiers of uh, surgical care that will be normally available or rather um, in the HIC setting that does not translate to the LMIC setting or the country or region that you are working in. It's important to ensure that there is a full understanding of the systemic uh, challenges before embarking on surgeries that may actually end up doing um, harm. And finally, as I started the talk, talking um, regarding the economic factor, there is this ethical and economic obligation to mitigate the economic consequences of um, not providing surgery. But at the same time, we need to ensure that there's a balance between working within the existing uh, structures. But how do we improve them? So that some innovative work that's been uh, used to tackle um, this uh, difficult uh, conundrum is to look at the prevention component to this. How do we mitigate uh, surgeries that may not need to happen if we were able to work with civil societies or um, public health um, departments and organizations, NGOs who work in the space uh, of prevention. And when I think of prevention, I really hone in on injury prevention because we know that that is a um, area that can be prevented with the right mechanisms uh, in place. Standardization of care. Should there be a level of um, standards of specific procedures that are uh, really governed by um, bodies within countries. And if that's the case, how are they followed and how are they put in, how are they put into place? It's a challenging um, proposition, almost one that falls into the realms of ideals, but standardization is important to ensure that there is some degree of protection uh, for patients. The education and programs that um, are ex existing in this space are a good uh, solid mechanism for really building up uh, surgical practice in country. Long-term educational programs really do promote the equity factor whereby we are ensuring that the skills reside in country and uh, the surgical procedures are, are performed by those who live and work in these spaces. And finally, partnerships. We've spoken about this already. Dr. Gucci has mentioned this um, quite clearly that partnerships are really the key to developing these, um, doing this work well and developing ethical uh, frameworks should be centered around these partnerships. Having um, equity, that 80-20 split um, as, your, uh, as your focus. So in summary, the overarching challenges of BAS when you think about them under the guise of feasibility, the power paradigm and sustainability, there are mechanisms and metrics for us to uh, really help us um, be our sort of compass, if you like, in guiding how we approach them. In terms of the key challenges, when we think about the uh, Beauchamp and Childress uh, framework, 
consent when we think about autonomy, the practice and benevolence and the unintended consequences that can occur because of the will and desire to uh, provide, provide care, which may be out of our scope for practice when we practice. And thinking about these things housed within the uh, systemic challenges that we face. And finally, the innovation factor. How do we uh, really harness these uh, areas in order to make sure that complex surgery in terms of the absolute and relative factors can be uh, delivered and really move towards meeting that unmet need in an ethical way? Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. Boy, we, we're gonna have a lot of uh, discussion here in just a few minutes. We're getting some good questions from people. Please um, keep the Q&A coming. I'm keeping track of them. And, and as soon as we're finished with our third speaker, we'll get to those questions. So now for our third speaker, Dr. Rashi Junjunwala. She is currently a general surgery uh, resident at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And she has been a Paul Farmer Global Surgery Fellow in the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change for the last two years. Now for her third year, she will be our Chief Fellow in the program. After her Chief Fellow year, she will be completing her residency training in general surgery, and she plans to continue her work in global surgery as a trauma surgeon and an advocate for health equity. And I would also add, she has a master's in ethics, so she's well suited for this discussion. Dr. Jujunwala. Thank you, Dr. Mira, for uh, the kind introduction. And I'm really uh, glad to be here with everybody. Um, big shoes to fill, but um, I'm our third speaker for this evening. And um, I will be talking about whether short-term surgical mission trips still have a role in 2022 and onward. Um, we're just gonna start off with a case. So a 25, I'll read this kind of briefly, but a 25-year-old American med student who's interested in global health and surgery decides to participate in a global surgery trip at the end of her first year of medical school. So she fundraises all year and in June she goes to Haiti for a week-long surgical mission trip. While there she first assists on 30-ish hernia repairs, hydrocele repairs, and elective cholecystectomies as well as some emergency cases. She leaves the week with a newfound appreciation of the burden of surgical disease in low and middle income countries, a renewed love for surgery, and she has obtained certain technical skills that she would not acquire during the rest of her time as a medical student in the United States. About six months after she returns from the trip, she finds out that one of the patients she operated on died of septic shock after inability to arrange post-op care. So the question is, what is the problem and what are the problems? So as you've heard from Dr. Hedgelthia's talk and also from Dr. Joseph's talk, uh, you're going to hear some themes kind of reiterated, but I think that just speaks to the importance of them. Uh, the global burden of surgical disease disproportionately affects people in low-income countries and low- and middle-income countries with disproportionate challenges in managing the surgical disease process in these settings as well. So not only is there a lack of timely surgical access in many LMACs, but there's also a catastrophic economic burden if one is even able to access a surgeon or an OR. And uh, many of the reasons for this is because of a global shortage of surgical, obstetric, and anesthesia providers. So given the immense scale of this problem, we have to ask, as we often ask in surgery, is perfect the enemy of good? So, you know, in an ideal situation, uh, low income and low and middle income countries would train and retain their own surgeons, uh, obstetricians and anesthesiologists to provide first class care to their citizens, the same way that we expect in many high income country settings. So uh, you'll see a list on the left of numerous challenges to this ideal situation, many of which, uh, as have been kind of alluded to in the previous talks, are a result of colonialism and resultant wealth disparities, resources and education disparities. Um, you'll see this graph uh, to the right of the screen that describes the number of doctors, nurses, and midwives uh, per 100,000 population in each continent with relation to the number of DALIs or disability adjusted life years per 100,000 population. And you'll note that over 50% of the world's providers are located in Europe and the Americas. Uh, whereas 3% of the world's providers are located in Sub-Saharan Africa, which has the highest number of DALIs per population. So notably, you'll notice that uh, the situation is such that there are just not enough providers in places where the burden is very high of surgical disease. So given all of this, 
do short-term surgical missions provide a temporary, if not imperfect, real-world solution to the problem of inadequate access to immediate surgical care? Uh, you heard Dr. Joseph talk about some of the challenges here, and you heard Dr. Hedgothier talk about our moral responsibility. But we sometimes, uh, you know, need to think about it terms in terms of a um in a political philosophy approach as well so if high income countries are obligated to provide some sort of surgical health care to those in lmic's without sufficient training or resources the question is is a short-term surgical mission a reasonable way in which to offset this responsibility with the middle ground of sorts whereby surgeons can do good and offer some training provide some concrete life-saving intervention etc without requiring a complete upheaval of their own life and practice so while I won't delve completely into the world of political philosophy for this talk, uh, there are many ways in which nations govern their socioeconomic investments. So on one hand, you have countries that rely heavily on a status approach, which they prioritize care to their own citizen over others and only focuses, focus on emergency support for others when needed. However, uh, countries on the other hand, who rely on a cosmopolitan approach, uh, focus more on a global approach to welfare, emphasizing basic health welfare all. Welfare for all, excuse me. But you know, how much does this type of investment actually cost? And we talk about equitable distribution of resources. What do we actually mean by that? So the organization management and oper operating, operating costs of short-term surgical missions requires billions of dollars per year. So what is the responsibility of high-income countries that fund and support these missions and offsetting or displacing some of that overhead? And could they be better spent, could that money be better spent in education and infrastructure in the areas in which short-term surgical mission trips operate? So this paper uh, gives some sample statistics from 601 respondent physicians, indicating an increasing participation by US uh, physicians in short-term medical missions, including the opportunity cost of lost time uh, when they're not practicing in their home institution or their home country, uh, average, an average total economic input for an individual physician pursuing a short-term surgical mission for about a week on average exceeds $11,000. So composite expenditures for short-term medical mission deployment from the United States are about $3.7 billion an annually. And uh, the resource investment equates with a nearly 5,800 physician full-time equivalent. So that is a lot of money. So given all this money that we're spending on short-term surgical missions, what are the benefits and harms of this model? Uh, you know, we've talked about many concepts of benefit and harm, and we have to ask who's benefiting and who's being harmed potentially by, uh, by these trips. So on the top right hand uh, side of the slide, you'll see um, a blurb, which is actually taken straight from a, uh, a group that sends high income country participants to medical mission trips. And I won't read the whole thing, but I will just point your direction, your attention to the second paragraph, which begins, you can expect medical mission trips to hone your knowledge, skill sets, and problem solving capabilities. These trips will provide plenty of hands on clinical experience and train you to deliver maximum care with limited resources. In the end, these trips will make you a better practitioner, reinforce your passion for medicine, and show current and future employers that your boundless capacity for care makes hiring or promoting you an easy decision. Now, that is, in my opinion, a very biased benefit that is focused on entirely on the providers that are coming, parachuting in, if you will, to provide um, what they believe is care, but also to really gain experience and knowledge at the expense of others. So is participation in a short-term surgical mission a form of neocolonialism without any opportunity for redemption? Or does the all or, an all or nothing approach minimize the benefits that a well-run longitudinal and enduring short-term surgical mission structure could offer? So the other paper that you see here um, is a qualitative study of uh, local healthcare providers in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And in this study, uh, four themes emerged. So general perceptions, the perceived effect of these mission trips on the healthcare system, the perceived effect on healthcare workers and future recommendations. And in general, uh, the study found that local healthcare workers appreciated the skills and knowledge that teams impart and they improved access to surgical services for the poor. However, workers, uh, volunteers working independently of local teams creates negative perceptions. It stresses out the local healthcare providers and also strains the hospital resources. So uh, not to be a broken record with my fellow uh, panelists, but we really need to be working in collaboration with the teams that we aim to serve so that we can actually identify sustainable solutions. 
Uh, one other uh, systematic review that was published uh, reviewed 16, 1,600 studies, uh, 41 of which met full inclusion criteria. The studies reported a minimum of six month follow up, uh, showing a follow up rate of 56%, and really notably, a complication rate of 22.3%, which I just want to reiterate is an absurdly high number compared to what would be deemed acceptable in many high income country settings. 15 out of uh, 20 studies reported on follow-up also report on sustainability characteristics, but the 12 studies that did not report on duration of follow-up rate reported a complication of rate of 1.2%, which is kind of not, um, not really contextually located. So it's hard to kind of know what that actually means. So in summary, when you think about the harms of the, a, a trip like this, you think of lack of investment in buy-in and local infrastructure, uh, creation and setup and maintenance of neocolonial reliance on external funding structures, and then inadequate care potentially that's given by inadequately trained or equipped providers to deal with the, the patients that they're seeing. So if short-term social commission trips are to persist, persist, what requisite standards or guiding principles should we employ as rules for engagement? So this is a set of seven uh, guiding principles that was actually first um, first introduced in the world of pediatrics uh, in 2007, but I do think that there are many of the themes that we actually focus on in our own work these uh, today and also would carry forward. So you need to have, first and foremost, a common and specific, specific sense of purpose in your mission that is based on a, a collaboration that is truly based on a community and its infrastructure. And as has been mentioned um, most recently by Dr. Joseph in her, her speech or her talk, um, education and cultural competency training for volunteers, as well as strict rules for the scope of practice and emphasis on good communication and goal setting is absolutely crucial. We also need to focus on teamwork and building capacity for ongoing and sustainable uh, interventions. And then finally, monitoring and evaluation frameworks for both short and long-term outcomes, uh, patient safety schedules and plans for follow-up care, as well as referral networks to existing hospitals or clinics for post-op emergencies or issues to create actually a comprehensive network of sustainable and long-term care. So if we go back to the first slide of our 25-year-old med student, where could this have been improved? So she fundraises all year, contributing to that $3.7 billion investment uh, that Americans pour into, American physicians pour into this endeavor. Uh, would that money, could that money have been better spent elsewhere? It's possible. She goes for a week in which time she hardly has the opportunity to gain any sort of experience or context or develop strong or uh, notable partnerships. She's first assisting on, on all of these operations, which uh, is not within her scope of practice. She notably does develop a new pound of appreciation for the burden of surgical disease in low and middle income countries and comes away with that uh, appreciation, which drives her career in the future. But she also came away with a bunch of technical skills that she probably shouldn't have even been uh, having the opportunity to develop. Most importantly, uh, the patient who died of septic shock due to inability to arrange post-op care, that should not, should not have happened. So, you know, if you think about the answer of whether we should be still doing short-term surgical missions in 2022. Um, it's evident, you know, that the global surgical burden of disease is massive and it continues to grow. And although sustainable capacity building and educational efforts are without a doubt the gold standard to which we should all be striving, I do believe that there is a space for an equitable short-term surgical mission model um, for care for provision as a way to decrease the gap in surgical healthcare needs and healthcare delivery. But if we take on our communal responsibility, our charge is to adapt and improve the imperfect offering that we have with simultaneous focus on building capacity. We must focus both on the now and the future. So short-term surgical missions should be integrated with monitoring and evaluation frameworks, capacity building, and longitudinal training programs, as well as bilateral partnership initiatives. Thank you very much. And I will turn it back to Dr. Mira for the discussion. Well, Dr. Junhunwala, thank you so much. And thank you to all three of our speakers. That was fantastic. Um, it's a lot to unpack. And um, I think it's going to take us about two and a half more hours. So everybody get comfortable. We're going we're gonna to go through everything. No, I'm just kidding. We, uh, we have a half hour. And I'd, I'd like to get to some of the excellent questions from all of our participants. So I think I'd like to start back with Dr. Het Gauthier, because a couple of questions came in 
earlier that are really quite nice and they're in your wheelhouse. So uh, do you have suggestions as to how to address promotion policies to embrace equity and collaboration? And I know you do because I know you've spoken passionately about that. And, and I will tell our participants that um, Dr. Hep Gauthier is, is really a thought leader in this area, and I, I've learned a great deal from her over the last five plus years. And so, uh, Bethany, I'll let you talk a little bit about that to everyone. Thanks. Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely an area that we are, and we being a lot of folks who are on this call, both my fellow, fellow panelists, um, but also I see some names in the participant list that I know are, are chipping away at this. You know, it's for me, um, it, it a bit touches on, um, Dr. Jujuala, you had a quote in yours about the medical mission of like, you know, this will help with your CV building and this will help with your future prospects. And I, um, you know, was oftentimes finding myself being like, well, I need that first authorship and not thinking about my, the consequence of me pursuing my needs over, um, you know, the, the then residual consequence of my other colleagues and their needs, both, you know, the person down the hall, but also the person across the ocean um, from my global health work. And so, you know, your question is one that we've given a lot of thought to. Um, the Lancet piece that, that I had in my slide, we actually outline, um, that was the, the product of a two-day um, session where we had colleagues from around the world, many universities in the U.S., but also our collaborators thinking about you know, what are our pushes and pulls in our professional life that lead to these consequences? And then how can we change them? Um, and so there's some very specific recommendations in there. So one, um, for example, is um, from a like promotion standpoint, you know, they count the number of first author papers, right? And um, they will also not penalize me if I'm publishing papers without colleagues and giving them credit. So trying to put in more checks and balances to really evaluate not just you know, the research, but the nature of how we collaborate. And that's not just for global health collaborations, that's for any collaborations and with community partnerships. There's other suggestions there about like thinking about our administrative burden. So Harvard does not want me out of Boston for more than six weeks a year, but if you try to really address um, and, and manifest these partnerships that both Dr. Junyawala and Dr. Joseph talked about, like that's not something that can just happen overnight. It really takes time and, and trust. And so, um, you know, that administrative barrier can, can be a limit to that. So those, we have specific recommendations. Now the question is how do you change the policies? And, and we're doing some efforts through the Consortium of Universities of Global Health to try and have broader position statements and then really um, sort of put the pressure on the universities to, to note that, that the norms of global health collaboration are changing and they need to align the promotion policies to that. So happy to share that piece in the chat um, if, if that's useful and you can also just find the, the title of that paper in the slides. Thank you so much. And just so that our participants know, Dr. Het Gauthier has been a very strong advocate for changing those policies, even within our own university. And, and uh, it's not easy. It's a little bit like changing the direction of the Titanic, but uh, she's not going to give up. Um, just one follow-up question while we're talking about research, because there was another excellent question that came to us about, you know, how do you handle grants with, with your partners? And, you know, can, can a PI from another country, you know, can they be a PI on a U.S. grant? And how do you navigate the fairness around funding and who gets what? Um, I'll start with that and then and would invite others to chime in. Um, there are some grants for which I am uniquely eligible and not my colleagues and vice versa. Um, so we really try and it goes back to that comment around the administrative barrier. So especially pre-pandemic and we're, we're trying to resume them now to just be proximate, have colleagues here, maybe there and spend a lot of our time just brainstorming what do we want to be working on together. Um, and we have a long, long list of what we want to be working on together so that if a grant mechanism comes along that facilitates this common goal, but for which I'm uniquely qualified, I'm not applying because it's my idea for me, I'm applying to facilitate our team's work. And so, you know, there's that aspect of it. Um, the other aspect is, 
you know, how do we broaden our team's um, resources, our, our skill base, our expertise, so that other people can be applying for grants? So why am I qualified for a grant and maybe a colleague is it? And how do we make sure that in the process of implementing this grant that we're capacitating that person to be competitive for the next one? And so it's always thinking about you know, maybe you weren't competitive today, but you can be competitive tomorrow. So let's just make sure that we're strategic in, in, in addressing that. Okay, thank you so much. Let's, let, let's uh, switch to uh, uh, a workforce slash clinical question. And actually I throw it to both our, uh, our clinicians, Dr. Joseph and Dr. Jun Junwala, have uh, an excellent question here from Teo Eganusi. I listened to the aspect of the discussion on brain drain Will it be fair to conclude that all workers are stolen when some nations do not provide enabling atmospheres for staff to stay in their own countries? So Dr. Joseph, maybe you can offer a thought there and then Dr. Junjun Walla, you can follow up. Thank you uh, for the question. It's a, it's a great one and it is a reality. Um, it doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens almost in a systematic way in some places. I, and I'm happy to give this. Uh, example. Uh, when I was in the latter years of my uh, training, I remember being on call and having um, seen at least eight or ten new doctors from Nigeria. And I wasn't, I was just surprised they were in the, our emergency department. So I got talking to them and understanding uh, how it came about, there was a national recruitment uh, of four Nigerian doctors to come to the UK on a contract for 24 months and build their emergency uh, medicine skills, but with a view to potentially enter into full time training. So essentially, they're taking those who have the skills uh, from places uh, in need. And that was a systematic program because of the doctor shortage that we have in the UK. Uh, so yes, there is a brain drain, but the incentives are so great and high that it's difficult to say no. And I think the other part to that question was, um, is it because there are issues in their countries, residing countries essentially not stable? So how do you balance that out? Well, I think the answer is you support the systems that are, are in country to incentivize uh, for doctors to stay, but that's very challenging because what you're really talking about is financial support. And if an individual is to travel from that country to gain the finances that they would um, would to support their countries by working in, in elsewhere, then are you splitting the difference? It's a really hard question. And ultimately, when you speak to the individual who hasn't been paid for three months um, and can easily move country and earn a, a lot more money and continue their skills, it's very difficult to say to that person, no, stay in your country and not get paid. We will build the system in time because long term partnerships take time to build systems it does not happen overnight so yes there is a brain drain but there's always a, there's always a reason to leave because of the challenges with the healthcare system within the countries in which they reside thank you so dr jinjun while i you know dr joseph is talking about kind of active poaching and I, I i obviously think none of us feel good about that but but what about the more passive nature of this and and should high income countries be erecting barriers so that so that low income country uh, providers can't come to high income countries. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I was actually just scrolling through the Q and a questions and there's one uh, question that I think was I was already going to talk about it so i'll answer it, um, which is that <laughs> you know when we say global surgery, um, this is something that actually the four of us have spoken about many times um, and will probably continue to, but global surgery just means surgery, right? Like it means surgery, it just means people getting access to the care that they need. We call it global surgery because we are modeling it after global health because people hear things that they know and they reiterate those. But global surgery happens in the United States and it happens anywhere else. It happens in Sub-Saharan Africa, it happens in India, and it happens in the United States, right? So one of the, the questions that I'm alluding to in the chat was that, do you see brain drain um, as equivalent or, you know, or kind of related to 
physicians in the United States not going to rural areas or areas that are under supported in financial or other mechanisms. Um, and I do think that there is some sort of an equitable uh, relationship there in that it's really hard to say no when you are working, you know, for decades of your life to train for something that's an act of service to others, and then to finally be given an offer that you think you can't refuse, right? To live in a place that you want to live with your family that you may or may not have been able to live near or with for decades uh, for your training, you know, potentially to have some creature comforts that you weren't able to have in other places. And, uh, you know, for sometimes what seems like potentially an uphill battle or a thankless situation that you find yourself in. So I do think, Dr. Mayor, like when you were saying, you know, should we erect barriers? I don't know that barriers are necessarily the way to go about things in general, um, but I do think that there is something there in not only um, not only providing financial incentive for the more challenging of these types of uh, jobs or positions, but also being really thoughtful as high income country um, hiring practice providers <laughs> that who were we hiring and why. But then I think the thing that gets really challenging is who made me the boss. So just because of a miracle of birth, I happen to be born in the United States as opposed to somewhere else. I have now been given the the responsibility potentially to choose who does or doesn't get access to the same kind of education and training and opportunity that I have. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, but that shouldn't be necessarily the case. So I, I think my answer is I don't think that barriers provide, you know, put up by high income country participants or practitioners is necessarily the answer, but it's more about incentivizing um, the way that, um, you know, benefits are distributed elsewhere. I don't know if that's a skirting your answer, but a no, no, answer no, I think, your question. No, I, I think that's I think that's very true. I, you know, um, Lars Hagander, who was one of the commissioners on the Lancet Commission, did some research looking at um, clinicians who had come. I believe it was to North America, but it might have been to all high income countries, and did a survey and and uh, found that one of the main reasons um, for folks to leave their home country was just what the uh, participant who asked that question brought up was that, you know, there aren't the local, there isn't the local atmosphere, the local community, the local, um, you know, uh, folks to, to uh, work with. And so I think, you know, on one hand, you're talking about the fact that people have agency and should be able to decide what they do with their lives. And then Michelle was saying, look, but what we should be doing is building capacity and building environments so that people don't feel like they have to leave. So I, th I think, you know, it's not one or the other, and, and it, obviously it's not going to happen by tomorrow, but, uh, but I, I think the answer is, is all of the above. Um, back to research just for a moment, uh, Dr. Hetgothier, how do you enter into, on a, in a pra very practical sense, how do you enter into relationships with your partners so that, you know, the authorship is, is more fair? Because I know that's, uh, that's been something that you've really focused on it. And I think it's really important because it's so easy. I mean, I know from personal experience, it's so easy to, you know, get working on a paper and you, you, you know, you crank it out and you, you know, pretty soon, you know, the authorship is really not very fair. So how, how do you get started on and get off on the right foot? It's a great question. Um, I mean, it's definitely, even for me, a continued work in progress, right? Like I do not pretend like every paper gets it exactly right. Um, and it's complex. So I would say the first and foremost, one of the barriers that I realized I had to this, and it was a bit the, the point I was trying to make around really trying to understand who you are in this space, was just realizing that um, I wasn't being honest with myself or my colleagues about what I needed out of projects, right? So, you know, I'm here to help. I'm here to support this research project. And then I found myself clamoring for first authorship without even realizing I was doing it and realizing why I was doing it. And so, you know, for myself, I try to really think about, you know, what do you need? What do your colleagues need? Um, and it's, there are, our teams have 10, 15, 20 people on them. So really trying to balance, you know, now as I'm more senior in my career, oftentimes serving in that PI role where my responsibility is to think about every single individual, what their goals are, 
what their needs are, what their skills are, and really trying to balance the opportunities for that. Um, we keep a paper list. So as soon as someone comes up with an idea, it goes on our paper list. And the first person who gets priority for that idea is the person who came up with it. Um, it doesn't always paint out that way, but it's a conversation. It's really um, thinking through, you know, so Dr. Joseph may have come up with an idea, but maybe it was her 10th really good idea. So thinking through like, what, what are your priorities on this? And then can we share some of those other opportunities? And it's a constant dialogue. Um, and by constant, I mean, I probably spend two to three hours a week just navigating authorships and various opportunities. So I think just having open conversation, again, really trusting that you can be honest about what you need and that people can be honest with you, um, all of that, and then just putting things in writing and really trying to stick to those commitments are, are some of the strategies we've adopted. And so obviously, the, the, you know, the dialogue and the conversation is important. Do you, have you gotten to the point where you have a hard and fast rule and you say, look, I'm not going to submit a paper unless there's you know, co-first authorship with one person from our shop and one person from over there or co-senior authorship or, I mean, do you, do you get to that point where it's like hard and fast rules or, or are you still trying to work through it with conversation? Um, so I never think of a paper in isolation, right? I think about a paper in the full portfolio of work. So there might be a situation where um, we have a balance that, that someone might look at that single paper and say, it's in balance. Mm -hmm. But I think about it as like the full body of work and, you know, who brings what skills to the table and some papers, like we do machine learning papers yeah. that really rely on an expertise of a colleague um, at MIT. And so that might have more of his students on it. And then we do papers that are really about clinical protocols and that might have more colleagues um, from Rwanda on it. So I don't think about a single paper. One of the challenges I've put to myself is that at least half of my papers have um, Rwandan first authors, at least half of them have Rwandan senior authors for my papers from Rwanda. So it's more about the full body of work, not a single paper. Right. And I will say um, there was recently an authorship reflexivity statement that is fantastic. And so I think sitting down and for that paper, thinking about how did I engage partners? How did I think about this opportunity in the context of other opportunities? And that reflexivity statement is actually something that our teams we're adopting, not just for papers, but for how we go through our day-to-day -day research. And right. so I put that link in, because I do think it's a helpful reflection for um, my day-to-day -day and, and how I'm engaging my full team, no matter where they sit. Right, right. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Joseph, you talked a little bit about power and power imbalance. Just speak a little bit more to that in, in the sense that, you know, let, let's say I uh, go on one of these, you know, medical missions and I, I'm going to, I'm all excited. I'm going to do some cleft lip repairs somewhere. What, what happens? What, what, what do you mean by power imbalance? I show up somewhere and what happens actually? Well, one would hope that there was an ask to begin with and that um, the need you were trying to meet was uh, a request from a surgeon in country who wanted you to assist in these difficult cases. One would hope that that is the scenario. However, that may not be the case. Uh, and in, if it's not the case, then what may happen is you are contacted via an NGO uh, to perform X number of surgeries at X hospital within a very short period of time. Uh, you may not be familiar with the hospital, build any relationships with the surgeons, and your approach may be one that is consistent with a uh, HIC facility or OR environment, but is not conducive to getting the best out of people in an NIC or NMIC uh, setting. You do the surgeries, um, very skilled but you don't have all the tools that you need because you're not used to working in that environment so suddenly where it would have been fairly simple for you there may be complications but you have to go back home you have to get back to bch you got to get back to your list and also the time difference so you can't help in real time with all the complications that may or may not occur so suddenly you're left with this real true desire and need to do the right thing to help to assist because with cleft palate cultural issues, there may be stigmatization with someone who has a deformity. So it's not a unrealistic or inappropriate ask to allow someone to be 
integrated to society because you have fixed their facial deformity. However, the potential consequences may be far greater than the stigmatization they would have faced. That is a, a case example of what may or may not occur. And, and uh, you know, pushing that a little bit further, Dr. Junjunwal, so, you know, I show up somewhere and what happens in the, in the hospitals in the surrounding region? You know, when, when, when I bring a big group of, you know, a hundred folks down to some hospital, you know, within a hundred miles of that hospital, what, what happens in the surrounding area? Well, I can actually give you a personal example of what happens. Uh, <laughs> so if, it wasn't abundantly clear. Uh, the 25 year old medical student was me uh, that I spoke about. Um, and when I was on that exact trip, actually, um, people were traveling for miles, miles to come see the American doctors, right? Um, jokes on them, there was one doctor, the rest were medical students, um, which, you know, we have our place, but um, they weren't coming to see doctors, they were coming to see the American team. And not only were people traveling for days sometimes to come and see us, uh, they were also bypassing other clinics and other um, in, like you know, other hospitals that were in the central plateau that were equally able to provide them with care that we were providing because we were doing blood pressure checks and you know um, prenatal checks uh, for pregnant pregnant people. Um, and that's something that many people could have done that they passed by along the way because of the word that had gotten out that the American doctors were coming. And I think I would just say one other thing about power imbalances um, that um, Dr. Joseph had touched on. A lot of times you have to think about, um, and this is something else we were talking about earlier today a little bit, you have to talk about, you have to think about what questions you're asking people because sometimes you might be not asking the right questions. And so when um, the, at the start of that, the same trip, um, the organization took us, you know, to go see some of the family members or some of the uh, families that we were uh, going to see later in clinic. And they were like, oh, why don't we do a vaccination survey to see how many of these children have been vaccinated? And so, you know, we go down the street and we ask everyone like, oh, you know, have you been vaccinated? And they're all like, yeah, we've been vaccinated. And then I just asked them, one of the kids, I said, when was the last time someone asked you this question? And they said, oh, last week when the last group came. <laughs> so, you know, there is inherently this system that's set up to not only prioritize the investment that the HIC providers give, and again, not to go back to the same situation, but you see this in the United States as well, right? You want certain, some patients want a certain type of doctor. They don't want a doctor that looks a certain way because they want they think that the best doctor is the white male doctor. They don't necessarily think the best doctor is the person who's taking care of them um, for many reasons, right? But I think that all speaks to the same concept of being really conscientious about what it means to do a short-term surgical mission trip and ask the right questions about, like, like Dr. Joseph was saying, I hope there was an ask for you to come do that cleft that cleft, um, you know, cleft trip. Um, is that something that's aligned with the community? Um, and are you actually engaged as a person who is a member of the community also, or trying to help, or are you someone who um, is getting the best show possible in order to elicit further engagement? So I think there's a lot of things that come up with that power question that also you might not even realize if you're not asking the right questions. Well, you hit on something, and I, I haven't prepped you for this, but you hit, you hit it on something perfectly in that um, over a decade ago, uh, our team and one of the local teams, I won't say where to give it away, but did a little research project looking at what happens at surrounding hospitals when a local, when a team comes to one particular hospital. And it's exactly what you just said, but we also looked at the clinical throughput at those surrounding hospitals. And what happened is the clinical throughput dropped at all the surrounding hospitals because everyone was coming to watch the, these folks come from, from other places. So there are definitely some unintended consequences that uh, that you have to be you have to be aware of. Dr. Heck, go you back to research just for a moment. If you had a magic wand, how would you restructure funding, like from USAID and Gates and Clinton, and how do you make funding so that it promotes equitable research? That is a hard question. Um, 
you know, my knee-jerk reaction, say, give it to all of our projects. <laughs> <we're driving laughs> really hard, but but I mean, I feel like, I feel like sometimes the funding, uh, you know, promotes some of these issues. And so how, how, how would you make the funding mechanism such that it's, it's better? And, and you know what, I'll, I'll throw another part in there um, that's, that's related. Uh, because you've been involved in, you were involved in something in Rwanda that said, what are some examples of building capacities in LICs and LMICs in lieu of short-term mission trips? Like who is in charge of the development? So how do we change the funding paradigm around research, but even, even capacity building, you know, to, to change the whole paradigm? Yeah, you know, that question um, is really the one in the chat, and, and then I'll get to, you, to your question as well, John, um, really got me thinking, and Again, I, I'm not a surgeon, so I'm not doing these short-term medical trips, but a lot of my early career, I'm a statistician, a lot of my early career was teaching short-term math courses and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so doing a three-day logistic regression course. And um, and um, Dr. Junior Wall, I think you were the one commenting on this about oftentimes what I taught, when I taught it, and the like sort of the structure of it was all about, well, I have four days and I have some motivation to be in this country. And so I'm just gonna like reach out to the university and say, I'm gonna, I can do this, right? And, and it was a very specific ask. Um, that is very different now than how I try, than how now I try to approach it, which is, okay, these are the skill sets that I have. This is the time frame that I have. Um, you know, is there a value that I can contribute? What are your needs? What are, so I work a lot now with the Africa Center of Excellence in Data Science. What courses are coming on your curriculum? You know, how can I help? And, if, and sometimes they just end with, you're not useful to us now, right? Mm -hmm. And that is like a perfectly fine thing for someone to say to me, like your availability and your skill sets and your goals don't have match with our needs and our priorities mm -hmm. and our infrastructure. And I have a long-term friend and colleague, Janine Chanda, who just always reminds me, like, you know, we, she was at the University of Rwanda. We spend so much time bowing to the, the goals and the, the priorities of the people who are coming to teach three-day logistic regression courses that we never teach our survival analysis course because we're just doing these other courses. So mm -hmm. I think there is a parallel there to, um, to the surgical mission trip, right? And mm -hmm. how those are approached, right? There, I think there are, for those of you who are on the call, I think there are still opportunities for if you have two weeks and a very specific expertise, I think there are opportunities for that, but it's about doing it in a way that's not orthogonal to systems and mm -hmm. to programs and, and finding the right way to do that. So to your funding question, I mean, I think there's a direct line to that, right? So um, if my colleague wants a survival course, don't just say that you're only gonna fund logistic regression, right? Or <laughs> if my colleague wants a two-year training, don't only give funding mechanisms for six months. Um, from the research perspective, I always call it the butt and chair metric, right? Funders want more butts and chairs. They don't want better and deeper trainings and partnerships. So, um, you know, I think those are things that come to mind with funders, but I definitely think funders need to start adopting, you know, that, that reflexivity checklist that I think is gonna be shared with you. Um, you know, they should be asking grantees to be reflecting and really demonstrating their intentions in applications. Right. And that should be an evaluation criteria for sure. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, Dr. Junjun Wall, uh, go back to you again, because you brought up the issue of the 25 year old going down there. Because I've seen a question or two relating to, is it you know even ethical for us to be going over down these short-term missions? And I'll make it more for med students because, you know, why would why should we be sending a North American med student anywhere? Well, how, how do they help? What what value are they on a, on any type of a mission trip? Yeah, so I would say we shouldn't. <laughs> and <laughs> that was the only mission trip I went on, and I had such a bad taste in my mouth afterwards from kind of everything how it all went um, that I really threw. That is actually one of the reasons why. I I chose to do my master's in ethics um, because I knew I had these big questions. And uh, as Bethany mentioned, Dr. Hagethi, I mentioned a, a moral obligation. I felt that moral obligation to do more, but 
I didn't know the best way to navigate that for myself. And I think there was another question in the chat about, um, you know, is there other uh, ethical frameworks rather than Beecham and Childress that you could, you know, apply to these types of questions? And I, that's what I wanted to learn more about in, in doing that master's program. And so I would say to medical students, uh, it sounds very fun uh, to go somewhere and do something and maybe learn how to do a technique that you wouldn't be able to see somewhere else. But uh, I would posit that there are places in North America that you can get the same experience and probably way closer to home than you think. Um, and I actually got that question a lot when I was applying to surgical residency. Uh, you know, I went to I went to medical school in Atlanta, uh, and there are lots of disparities within the city itself. Um, in Boston, where I'm located now, there is, you know, a lot of evidence for um, life expenses dropping uh, once you cross a road um, from Mattapan to Milton. Um, that is not unique right? It's not a unique to Boston. It's not unique to Atlanta. It's true for pretty much anywhere that you have a city with people. Um, and I think that the advice I would give is to really re-examine the reasons why you want to do that short-term surgical mission and why, why you want to go to Uganda or Rwanda or Haiti rather than um, down the street. And if your answer is that you want a trip, you should just take a trip. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think people agree with you. I've seen a couple of comments uh, in line with that. Um, Dr. Joseph, there, I've noticed a few comments and questions here about uh, how do you use technology, telemedicine, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a way that can help us you know, establish better longer term relationships or help with equity? I mean, how, how do we use new technology to do this better? I think if COVID has taught us anything for us that are working in the global health and global surgery spaces that there is work to be done that can be done remotely and if you can capitalize on the technology that's available to you while also being able to be utilized by our partners in the countries in which we work. Um, I think it's important for us to really harness technology, not just in communicating, but also in training as well. What does it look like to be able to deliver training remotely? how do you push the boundaries of what currently exists? I think one company which us at the program Global Surgery and Social Change are familiar with is Proximy, being able to deliver training in theater in real time without having to be in country is really pushing the boundaries of technology, but also allows us to have more of a um, hands-off approach while still ensuring that training is being delivered in, a, in an effective way. I think more of us need to start using uh, technology to the advantage of our partners rather than to the benefit and uh, convenience of ourselves. If, that, if we shift our lens, I think we're able to push the boundary further. Another thing I'd like to mention is the um, Intuitive Foundation who are currently working on really being a disruptor when it comes to training allowing access to those who typically wouldn't have the benefit of going to medical school or being in those circles but being able to um, identify that they're bright enough to learn surgical skills and become surgical officers in their countries in which they reside by having the material readily available now there are a whole bunch of ethics around that you don't want anyone random person doing surgery, but there's an opportunity here for us to bypass the traditional route in order to ensure that we are training up the numbers that are required in order to deliver the surgery that is needed in these spaces. All right, well, gosh, we, we have three minutes left. So just in, in the short time that we have, maybe in the order that, that uh, the speaker spoke, maybe uh, I'll let each of you just offer a few final comments or if there's a specific question that you really liked that I didn't get to because there were so many fantastic questions, uh, go ahead and answer that. But uh, so Dr. Het Gauthier, if you have just a comment or two or you wanna answer a question that I didn't get to, please go ahead. I mean, there's so many great comments in the Q&A um, and questions, but I, I just wanna express gratitude for this space. And, and I've known Dr. Mir, Dr. Ginger and Dr. Joseph for a long time. and 
Um, I think part of why I'm getting better, and again, not perfect, is just having these conversations. And so to Dr. Concha and the team, just having this space and really pushing us to think more about this. I think it's so important to have these conversations and, and hope you continue it offline after these sessions for those of you participating. Thank you. Dr. Joseph, a comment or two or a question that you wanted to answer that, uh, that I didn't get to? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to share my thanks as well. It's a real opportunity to share the panel with colleagues, but also to read all the fantastic questions in the chat. There are so many that I would like to um, answer, but one that really uh, stands out for me and I think is important is um, there's not one framework that fits all. In an ideal world, you could have a four point system and apply it, but that's not the reality. These are nuanced and complex uh, problems and complex problems require complex solutions. So it's important for us to take things in the context of um, the circumstance rather than utilizing um, some frameworks only. There was a question regarding are there any other, other frameworks are out there? And I would suggest the application is very much dependent on the circumstance. Thank you so much. Dr. Junjun Wala. Yeah, I guess I'll just speak uh, briefly um, as the trainee in, on the panel. Um, I would encourage all of the medical students and trainees who are here listening to uh, really question the, or undergrads even, anyone who's thinking about a career in surgery and is motivated by global health. Um, I would just think about ways to show your commitment to this space and this work without having to feel like you need to be traveling somewhere that's, as Dr. Audra says in the chat, Instagrammable, um, you don't have to. And if you can show your commitment to the communities that you wanna actually work with and in, um, that will come through. And I think it is important for us to keep that moral compass um, despite what we might be swayed by, because the same pressures that exist when you're a medical student or an undergrad are the same pressures that Dr. Hedgothia was talking about that push, push you to try and achieve something for promotion down the line. And I think um, I personally am just working on practicing staying true to myself and my moral compass on that. So I would encourage you to do the same. Then, well, so first of all, uh, I, I want to start out by thanking all the participants for spending 90 minutes with us. That was a commitment, and I, and I hope it was enjoyable. I, I'm seeing some very nice comments, and I appreciate everyone's comments. Secondly, I want to thank our three speakers. They put a lot of time into those talks, as you could tell. They were new, new lectures that they put together, and, and I, I, we really appreciate what they did. And then I want to thank the uh, uh, HMS Center for Bioethics. That fantastic venue. Uh, we, it's really an honor to be able to do this with all of you. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to uh, Dr. Hanto and, and, the, and the crew. And thank you so much. This was really a wonderful opportunity. Well, I'd just like to reiterate uh, Dr. Mirror's thanks to Dr. Het Gauthier, Dr. Joseph, and Dr. Junjuwala uh, for excellent presentations and discussion. And uh, also particularly to Dr. Mira for uh, moderating the discussion and doing a great job getting to many of the questions that were in the chat room. And also thanks to all the participants and the questions. Um, uh, as Dr. Muir has indicated, the uh, uh, feedback we're getting so far is that uh, people did really enjoy the uh, presentations, learned a lot uh, about uh, global surgery and some of the challenges that have been brought up by the speakers. So. Uh, we'd just like to uh, reiterate uh, our thanks and uh, thanks to um, the Center for Bioethics uh, and their staff, uh, uh, Ashley, uh, Helen, Kyle, uh, for their work in uh, making this technologically uh, work and uh, for um, helping us learn how to manage the Q&A. We, we couldn't have done it uh, without, uh, without you. So um, to uh, all the participants, we look forward to hopefully seeing you next week. Um, on Monday, we will have our session will be ethical issues in gender surgery. And the uh, moderator of that session will be Christine Mitchell, who is the executive director of the Center for Bioethics. So we hope to see you all here uh, next week and uh, Godspeed. Good night.